I may have found the strangest Halloween movies that no one seems to know about. It started with this movie, A Halloween Puppy, but from there it took me on a journey to unearth some of the strangest films I have ever come across. So I suggest you watch this until the end because it gets interesting, that's for sure. So let's start from the beginning. I was doing some digging on the internet looking for some low budget Halloween fun to celebrate this month. When I came across this film, A Halloween Puppy, what appears to be a wonderful family friendly spoof. The ratings for this movie were through the floor, so naturally I had to get my my hands on it. Unfortunately, this movie was removed from the only platform it was available for streaming on, but that did not stop me. I scoured the internet, checking every single grimy back corner website I could find just to have a taste of what this movie had to offer to no avail. It was like the movie had been scrubbed from the internet, so naturally my curiosity was exploding. I had to order the DVD of this movie and then purchase an external DVD player in order to even watch it. Look what just came in the mail. I am so so excited for this. A Halloween puppy. Look at that cover art. That is beautiful. That's something else. So let's read the synopsis of the film. A boy accidentally turns his mom's boyfriend into a dog. Oh, well now I gotta see this. And is this movie as bad as the ratings suggest? Yes. Yes, it is. The movie starts off incredibly promising with an animated intro of ghouls and goblins making you think, hey, this movie's gonna be pretty spooky. It's gonna have all of those things. It seems like for the intro, they forgot it was not just about Halloween, but a Halloween puppy. Because suddenly stock photos of puppies start appearing as if they were an afterthought in the intro sequence. It also might be important to note that none of the puppies shown in the intro are ever the same type of breed of dog as the one that's on the poster of the movie, which is the only dog feature or ever seen in the movie. The film establishes the story taking place probably in the greater Los Angeles area in what looks like a $10 million mansion and then immediately cuts to this incredibly long shot from the perspective of someone walking down a hallway. This is intended to be spooky, but it goes on so long that it seems like that they forgot that they were filming. And cut. Sammy, uh, Sammy, cut. Cut. Cut! Whoa. Uh, what? Sammy, I called cut. What the fuck are you doing? Oh, sorry. I was thinking about the Eiffel Tower. Like, why don't they just call it French Tower? Uh, d -d 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 Wait, hold on. Let me see that shot first. We might have something here, son. We're then introduced to two of the main characters, Adam and his mom, Linda, who works as a veterinarian. She's coming home from work, and her idea of greeting her son is to tell him that a monitor lizard swallowed a chew toy at work, and then gives him that chew toy as a bit, and he acts like that's the best joke that he's ever heard. <laughs> I thought my son could appreciate a fully chewed chewed toy. <laughs> That's just gross. Why would he want that? Adam's main character trait is that he's obsessed with Halloween to the point where he acts like this. Oh, by the way, can I have a Halloween movie night? Please. What? How old is this kid? He's gotta be 17 years old in this movie. Why is he doing a little kid beg to his mom to have a Halloween movie night? That's a little strange. So then Adam goes to sleep and then What? Where did the budget for the title cards in this film go? Did they spend all that money on the intro? So the next day, it's Adam talking to his mom about how he doesn't want to go to college, with Adam making reference to the literal mansion that they live in as a fallback option, I guess. Besides, look at this house. We live like kings. And then his mom gives the weirdest explanation for why they're living in this mansion. No, we live like people who got a great deal on a short-term rental because a formerly sick Pekingese had a very grateful owner who also just happened to be a real estate agent. That sounds less like a real reason and more like an alibi. Linda, what happened to the previous owners? What did you do to them, Linda? They spend time talking about one of the central plots of the movie, which is Linda's boyfriend, Ted, <gasps> being very predictable and Linda feels as though she's in a cycle where every time they hang out they're just doing the same thing and their relationship is going nowhere. This whole conversation happens when they are this close to each other. That is like two feet. If my mom got that close to me in a conversation, I would be like, oh, whoa, what? Am, am I in trouble? Adam has all of these plans for how he wants to spend Halloween because it's his favorite holiday and he wants to be able to use his mom's car for Halloween night. His mom responds with this. It's Halloween, okay? You're gonna be in ghost, ghoul, movie overload, okay? Google-eyed, let's see. 
Uh huh. Driving on two wheels, dreaming up new monsters. Absolutely not. I'm driving. You're telling me that this kid has such a significant Halloween addiction that he's unable to operate a motor vehicle? This has become a disability for him? That's worrisome, to say the least. We're then introduced to Ted, played by Eric Roberts, who was also this guy in The Dark Knight. I just thought I would mention that. And he comes in with a box of donuts, but he weirdly does not eat a single donut and instead is just licking the frosting from the inside of the box? Sir. Sir, stop, sir. Linda then tries to talk to Ted about improving their relationship before he goes to work, but he is a weird, clueless man. And then he leaves for work and Linda's like, sick. Later on, Adam is setting up the Halloween decorations, which feels a little late in the game, given the fact that it's the day before Halloween. And we're introduced to the classic and literal girl next door, Molly. She comes out of the woods, nobody knows from where, and she's here to show Adam a spooky book. Look at this. It looks cool. Kind of like the Necromicon. What? I had the same reaction, Molly. The Necromicon? He's talking about the Necronomicon, which is a fictitious ancient book of the dead. But if he is talking about what I think he is and just saying it wrong, that makes his reaction here even funnier. The Necro... <sighs> Never mind. I'll just show you the movies. You know, you seem so smart. And then you're so not smart about the things that matter. You're such a fucking dick. You don't even know how to say it, dude. Cauldrons, plants, animals. This is like some medieval witch's spell book. I mean, I guess. It looks like a Bible from a burnt down Motel 6, but I suppose ancient spell book is also an appropriate takeaway. This entire scene, and really the whole movie, kind of gives off Spanish class videos from middle school vibe. No sé por qué hicieron esta la película. I use Google Translate for that. Uh, I don't know where we're going to get what looks like the horn of a unicorn. Most of that stuff has modern equivalents. How do you know that? I'm just interested in it, that's all. No big deal. There's a slight hint that Molly knows how to do magic, and then Molly goes inside to say hi to Linda, and they sit on this shot of the spell book for very long. Almost as if to say, book important book part of story. So Linda vents to Molly about how she's got some personal issues in her life going on, as they stand once again way too close to each other. And Molly suggests that Linda could use her parents' cabin to have like a getaway weekend. To which Linda responds with this. Yeah, I've got some personal stuff going on and I think going away for the weekend would be the perfect way to take care of it one way or another. Why'd you say it like that? How did Linda manage to make an innocent conversation seem suspicious with that one line? She decides that the perfect time to go on this trip would be tomorrow. You know, Halloween, her son's favorite holiday. Surely he'll be fine with that. And then she leaves to go call Molly's parents. We're then introduced to what I suppose are the main antagonists of the film, Nikki and Chad. They're Adam's neighbors and they've basically come over to bully him and take Adam's Halloween supplies for their haunted house. Halloween, huh? I like Halloween. I like seeing little kids scream. This guy is gonna be in jail by 20 if he keeps saying shit like that. We're making a haunted house. It's gonna be at our place. Oh, neat. Yeah, it's gonna be the scariest thing you've ever seen. I don't know. I've been to the haunted hayride or the haunted hotel. Down no way. Ours is gonna be scariest. It's gonna be in our garage. It'll be totally scary. Well, if you guys are involved, I know it's gonna be scary. Yeah. This is a really weird conversation. It's like half bullying and half small talk. What is happening here? It seems like Adam is less intimidated by them as he is uncomfortable around them. Also, everybody in this movie refers to these two as the twins, and they all say it in the same exact tone. Oh, the twins. Oh no. The twins. Oh. Twins. What are these guys, like Tweedledee and Tweedledum? Linda comes outside and tries to stop them from stealing from them, but then they just ignore her completely and steal the box. Also, that box has to be like 10 pounds. Why are they carrying it together? So later on, Linda fills in Adam with her plan to go to this cabin with Ted the next day and weirdly asks Adam to come with her, you know, on Halloween. And by now you mean in November, right? Not, not on Halloween, my favorite day of the year. What a terrible mom. Also, why does Adam even need to be there? He's not involved in their relationship problem. And she gives the strangest justification for doing it on a whim. Okay, okay, look, I know it's a really big day for you, but I'll make it up to you, Adam. I mean, you, you are man enough to know that- Whoa, you have to, you know, whoa, take care of things come like on now. Right Adam eventually agrees and then proceeds to complain to Molly about it, who ends up also agreeing to come on the trip. And then Adam goes on another tangent about how much he likes Halloween. I I like going to Mr. Flyswatter's haunted garage and seeing what new creatures he's dreamed up this season. 
I like watching as many horror movies as I can on three separate screens while eating piles of candy pretending that it's human flesh. He wants to eat candy and pretend that it's flesh? You know what they give out around this neighborhood? Whole candy bars, not just those little ones. He's trick or treating at 17? What is his problem? This kid needs to get some help because he is showing the telltale signs of a physical addiction to Halloween. Imagine if he did this for every holiday. He would be the weirdest person to be around. What is going on, high schooler, fellow high schooler Trent? Hey, what's up, man? You excited for Christmas break? Uh, yeah, Trent. My dad just bought a 45 and spikes for the fireplace. We're gonna get him for sure this year. Huh, okay. Uh, Brent, are you and your dad gonna try to kill Rudolph, Santa Claus? And there's Santa, and there's and there's Mrs. Claus, and there's the elves. Oh, there's the elves, all right. The elves are coming, the elves are coming, they're coming, aren't they? And they're gonna hey, Trent, what is wrong with him? Oh, you know, it's just crazy Adam. He gets a little bit too much into the holiday Scottish spirit. <laughs> Did somebody say spirits? I love Halloween. Oh, Wait, what? Shit, what? Wait, what? 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 what do you mean? So Linda convinces Ted to come to the cabin that weekend, and he agrees, but says he has to show up after he's picked up his car from the mechanic. And that night, in order to cheer Adam up, Molly has Adam join her in trying to perform a spell from the Motel 6 Bible that she found. They perform a spell in which they say, Ted, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Which is just a famous line from the day the earth stood still, and also not Latin, which she said the book was written in. The spell does nothing at first, but then Ted comes along, asks them what they're up to, and when they respond, he says, Nito! Nito. Which incidentally causes the spell to activate, as displayed by this very high budget VFX, and sends a yellow orb into Ted's face, causing him to become tired and go to sleep. It's also abundantly clear that they shot Eric Roberts' scenes during the day, and then attempted to color correct to try to make it look like it was still night. Oh, we're doing this again. Okay. The next day, Adam comes downstairs and discovers with Linda a dog that has appeared in their house. So that dog is Ted, who has been turned into a dog by the magic. And you can also hear his thoughts. Linda! Oh, hi. Sorry, I fell asleep on the couch. I don't know what happened. So obviously, this is where the title of the movie gets its name. I'm a puppy? Oh! No, you're a fully grown English bulldog. This happens throughout the film, where the dog is very clearly a full grown dog, but everyone insists calling it a puppy. And it makes me feel like this is the only dog that they could get a hold of. Like they wanted a puppy, but they just couldn't get one. So everyone just pretends it's still a puppy. So Linda decides the best course of action is to take the dog with them to the cabin. And it's becoming wildly apparent that not even a nuke could stop this lady from going to this cabin. Also, this might be nitpicky, but at one point, Linda tells Adam, who's dressed in yesterday's clothes, to get dressed. He leaves to go do that. And the next time we see him, he's in the same outfit, and he wears that outfit for the rest of the movie. The drive to the cabin is a whole scene in this movie. It shouldn't be, but it is. It's made up of these shots of their car driving down a road with voiceovers from the cast that I can only assume had to be improv during the shoot. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. When are we gonna get there? And Adam? Well, he's still yelling about Halloween. I'm supposed to be looking up, like, all this zombie stuff, but no, we're out in nature and... It's, it's starting to feel like his interest is less in Halloween and more in mentioning topics that vaguely relate to Halloween. As if he's constantly trying to prove that he likes Halloween, but just learned what it is. I think the best part about this driving scene, though, is how they facilitate the change of setting for the viewer. So here's them driving down the road. They're very clearly in California. This is very likely on one of the roads going on the mountains that surround the San Fernando Valley. Then it fades into totally different climate. Looks like a forest in Oregon. This cabin is far away. Then it fades into, oh, they're still driving in California. Maybe that was like a memory or something. Then it fades into, okay, so this is a very far away cabin. They end the drive in the same climate they started in. Either way, Crazy Adam, Magic Molly, Dog Ted, and Psycho Linda have reached the cabin. Molly brings Adam to visit, I think, her family friend who happens to live nearby this cabin and is also a witch. This is my friend Adam. Hello, Adam. You seem dubious. No, ma'am. These are like AI conversations given form. In her clairvoyant nature, she knows that Molly and Adam performed a spell and wants to help them figure out what it is that they did. So they bring the witch lady the book and she says that it's a very powerful spell book and that you'd need extensive magical training in order to even attempt to perform a spell. But then two seconds later is like, oh, Ted turned into a dog because he said Nito. You didn't say Nikto? No, I didn't. See, we couldn't have transformed anyone. Perhaps, as long as no one said Nito. Wait, what? 
Magneto. My favorite part of this scene, though, is when she mentions the significance of the spell being done on Halloween, and Adam responds this way. So, if I had done the spell on St. Patty's Day, I'd have a pot of gold right now. Come on, man. The whole time you've been obsessed with the holiday, but the moment someone else places significance on it, he's like, I don't understand why this would be a big deal. You're telling me that we turned my mom's boyfriend into a Halloween puppy. Oh, I'm so grounded. He said the thing. That's the title of the movie. Is that what we're doing now? Just placing the name of the holiday in front of things that happen close to them? It turns out the solution is that they have to say the spell backwards at the place that it was cast in order for Ted to turn back into a human again, which is just like the undo button of spell books, I guess. As they're leaving, though, Adam asks the witch for proof that she's a witch so he knows that he can trust her, and she does this. Okay, let's go. Good luck. It seems that they bought four templates for visual effects and they're just cycling through them. You may be wondering what Linda and Ted the dog were up to this whole time because they did have a scene that was intercutting between the one I just talked about. There is a full five or six minutes in this film that is just Linda walking around with the dog, aggressively petting him with Eric Roberts commentating the whole time. There's shots of the dog eating grass and then Linda joining the dog in eating the grass. They even keep in shots where she's trying to wrangle the dog and the dog clearly wants nothing to do with her and they use that shot twice. Eric Roberts voiceover starts to get a little bit more weird. Uh, no, 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 no. It's really the simple things. I'm tired. But basically after this, Adam and Molly return back to the cabin and they make up some bullshit reason why they need to go back to LA. So they drive back to LA, are about to do the spell, but whoopsie fucking do, the twins stole the spell so they could have it for their haunted house. Then the only way that Molly and Adam can get the book back is that they have to go through the twins haunted house. Perfect. We were just looking for you. These two need to be in jail. The haunted house that the twins made looks like they're just getting their garage painted or something. Like this is the climate. Climax. This is the haunted house that we've been hearing so much about. I'm starting to think that Adam doesn't actually like Halloween if that is something that Molly needed to check in with him about. He's getting scared when a prop bat the size of a baseball falls in front of him. So they finally reach where the book is and they get ambushed by the twins. So we're just like, we're gonna beat you up. That's the entirety of our plan here. Oh, listen to you, big boy. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna lay down our altar and be our victim for the week. Do these guys have a fetish for crime? Plus, they're doing a haunted house and one of them is dressed as a cowboy. The least scary option for a Halloween costume. That's just a man that lived in Texas in 1912. Yeah, we're gonna kill you over and over again all night and spray you with fake blood and guts and stuff. What's going on here? What's happening? Either way, in the craziest twist of events in this movie, Molly decides in this moment to reveal the fact that she can use magic. She does like a Naruto jutsu and then creates another yellow orb and scares the twins away. I'm starting to think that the only magic that people can use in this universe comes in the form of yellow orbs. In the end, Molly and Adam reverse the spell, Ted turns back into a human, makes up with Linda and promises to improve their relationship. The twins apologize for being criminals and finally, Adam and Molly get a Halloween smooch. Terrible movie, but that's not where my story ends. So I initially thought I might want to do a double feature presentation for this video where I find another terrible Halloween movie. So I started looking at the suggested movies that were from the same director. I found this movie called 666 Teen Warlock. I was like, yes, this seems like it's going to be incredible. But this is when my search for low budget Halloween movies took an interesting turn. Here's the synopsis of the film. A witch informs a teen that he'll become a warlock on his 18th birthday. Okay. Very cool premise. Sounds like it's going to be maybe a Harry Potter or Percy Jackson type scenario. All right. The intro to this movie is also wild. This is going to be sick. This is going to be badass. I'm going to keep the summary of this movie straight to the point and very short because coming off of this movie after watching Halloween Puppy was really, really weird. To give you an idea, this is the opening sequence of the movie. I'm I'm Larry. I go to the school too. Is is Candace long for candy because you look good enough to eat. Okay. 
Okay, this kind of sets the vibe of the entire film. So basically, it's about this kid, Larry, who's visited by this witch who tells him he's now the gatekeeper of the world and has to stop an evil demon named Kevin from taking over the world and killing him. This one is also shot in a mansion, but this time the justification for them being there is that it's a private school. We're still in high school. Ugh, great. What's up? private school. But they made zero effort to change the hallways and rooms to appear as anything more than just someone's house. I started noticing in this movie an increase in men taking off their shirt or just having situations that they cannot find their shirt. There's a guy whose whole character arc is he just can't find his shirt. Hey, did you guys find a shirt for me yet? I guess not. Oh, I'm so confused. I just came down here to get a shirt. He just can't find his fucking shirt. By the end of the movie, not a single man is wearing a shirt and they have seemingly no intention to put one on. There's also the headmaster of the private school who at one point goes on this like misogynistic rant. As a young man like you, you can be taught, improved. But the same can't be said for the opposite sex. They're uh, uh, mischievous, devious creatures, illogical and they don't listen to authority. There's Kevin the demon that the main character is fighting, and you can tell he's a demon because he's got a big ass fucking horn in the center of his forehead. And the only real power that the character uses in this film is the ability to command people to do what he wants them to do with his mind. <laughs> Hmm, okay, all right, something's going on here. The actual teen warlock part is 30 minutes long. And then there's an additional hour of these three women that are in a theater watching other B movies with men with their shirt off? What relation did that have to the original movie? So I thought, okay, the main substance of that movie was pretty short, but it was funny. It was weird. Although I should probably find another movie to talk about and make it kind of like a trio of sorts. So I decided to order the DVD of this movie from the same director, David Day Control. It's called Three Witches. And I'm like, okay, it doesn't seem like anything could be off here. Probably just gonna get the classic campy B tier movie horror. It showed up in the mail and I looked at the cover art and I said, Oh, this cover art looks different than what I had ordered in the mail. Seven shirtless men have been added to the cover. So this is when I realized something was going on here. So I went to the director's IMDB page. David Day Control's filmography is made up of pretty much softcore, you know, softcore. I'm not gonna say it because I don't want to get demonetized. So for this reason, I'm gonna refer to it as lightly creamed corn. A lot of his movies are lightly creamed corn. However, in the marketing for these movies, they don't really say that that's what you're getting. The posters, the log lines, Everything makes it appear as if you're gonna see a classic horror B movie. I didn't realize until I was actually watching them that they were not totally that thing. Then when I looked at David's earlier work, it started to make a lot of sense. Wicked Stepbrother, Franken Queen, Nightmare Mansion, Boy Crazies, Bigfoot Island, Voodoo Academy. Are you noticing a trend here? But nothing would prepare me for the monster of a title that is Bigfoot versus D.B. Cooper. Oh my God. There's no way this could be lightly creamed corn, could it? This is a screenshot from the movie, right. which is a shame because seeing a mysterious man that hijacked an airplane in the 1970s go toe to toe with Bigfoot is a concept I would pay blockbuster money to see. There's also an implication in the title that they're of the same power level, like this is a match that we've been waiting years to see. When did they become rivals? Was it before or after D.B. Cooper hijacked the plane? Did Bigfoot have a flight to catch and D.B. Cooper ruined his holiday plans? Bigfoot goes toe to toe with his ultimate rival, the guy that stole a plane, causing him to miss Thanksgiving dinner with his dear mother, Big Mom. Also, Eric Roberts is also in this film. How does he keep getting Eric Roberts? Does he owe David money? After Halloween Puppy, David started making more films that were based around speaking animals, such as Easter Bunny Puppy, A Talking Cat, A Talking Pony. So it appears that A Halloween Puppy was his first attempt at making a family film, and he still couldn't resist just adding a little bit of David magic in there. Listen to you, big boy. Yeah, we're gonna kill you over and over again all night and spray you with fake blood and guts and stuff. The titling of his movies can also get a little strange, such as Bunker of Blood colon Chapter 6 colon Zombie Lust colon Night Flesh. That is a loaded title, especially when I realized that chapter one through four of that saga aren't even listed on IMDb. And to be honest, 
I don't even know if they exist. Inherently, these movies are intended to be niche, and I understand that there's a market for them. There's nothing wrong with that. But to give them posters and titles that make them appear as if they are normal movies, David is being a ruthless businessman. There could be potentially thousands that have unintentionally watched homoerotic, lightly creamed corn. And for that, I salute you, David. It's kind of a baller move. I had no idea that finding this movie, a Halloween puppy, would take me on a journey like this, but my God, I hope you found it as ridiculous as I did. Happy Halloween.